All right. Hello, everyone. I've um, really enjoyed today, and I think that there's one thing about bumping into ideas which you deeply resonate with, and there's also something about bumping into ideas which you disagree with. And both of them really prompt creativity, and hopefully you all find something you resonate with and something you disagree with in this. So uh, I've, I'm, I've gone with a sort of theme of the art of entrepreneurship and what it means for me. And it's worth noting that I guess I have quite a fringe view. So this is sort of like a fringe arts view of entrepreneurship and the parallels between the two. So I think that there's, when I think about entrepreneurship and, and how I see it, there's, there's this, a big part of it which is about seeing reality, looking at the world really deeply. And I think this is quite similar to how artists view the world that the idea of you look into quite complex systems and you see to the heart of them. And artists try to capture that and reflect it and present some truth. Entrepreneurs try to change it. But there's something around looking into the world and seeing not how it is, but how it could be, and seeing the spaces in between. And for me, that, that practice and that art of seeing the spaces in between, seeing the possibility, is a, a, a big part of it. Entrepreneurs fill those spaces with dreams. And I think a dream is much more than just an idea. It is, it's more visceral, emotional, experiential. It's something which uh, you sort of, you, you find ideas, dreams find you. And I think that there's a, a big part of it which is around seeing what could be and having that, that could be grab you viscerally. And that I, I've used the phrase before, like fish hooks in the brain. This thing which gets in there and, you just, and it just rattles around and rolls around and it, it has a life cycle and a, a, a part of its own. And, and I'm not much of an artist, well, any of an artist really. And that for me, entrepreneurship is the craft I most identify with. But my understanding is that's very similar to the inspiration which moves someone to create. And I think this idea of there's something fundamentally human about this process of seeing something, seeing a possibility, and being compelled to follow that opportunity. Once you, once you have the dream, you refine it. And this is a, a, a gem cutter, polishing a diamond. And a lot of it is around cutting away the stuff which is not true. So when, when you hear sculptors talk about making great masterpieces, it's like they see the potential of it and they remove everything that isn't the masterpiece. And I think with, as entrepreneurs pursuing ideas, a lot of this is around testing our ideas against reality. And if you look at all the tools on this tool set, like there is a huge raft of tools and practices and processes that we basically use to refine our ideas and make sure that they are true, to make sure they're not um, dreams which have no basis in reality. And we sort of try and carve them and shape them and, and sculpt them and iterate them and, and whatnot. And that for me, that's when I think about the art of entrepreneurship, there is something around the, the, the process of inspiration and dreaming. But the skill, the practice, the learning, it's about how to do this well and efficiently and to get it right. Because when you get it wrong, thing falls apart. Some of the tools of entrepreneurs. I think that, <laughs> for me, the, the, that, that process and that practice of, uh, of crafting an idea, so much of it is about bouncing it off other people. What do you think of this? What inspires you? What lights you up? Getting more information. And the, that sort of serves lots of purposes, but it's all of, the, part of it's about shaping the idea to reality. Another big part of it is around where, who else connects with this dream. And particularly when you think about building teams, for me, a huge amount of that is deeply listening to people and understanding their story and their context and what their dream is. And how does that fit into this dream or my dream? And how can you start to create space for both of them to cohabit together so that you have a dream which is bigger than any one of us? And that the, a lot of that happens over conversation, listening, coffee, talking. And so that, that art of, uh, of telling stories and listening to stories and, and putting them together into something, that feels like a big part of the craft for me. And then it's about taking it to the next level, which is about deeply held shared dreams. That when you start to talk to one person and two people and three people and build teams together, that it's... What, what makes a team magical for me is when there's this sense of a deeply held shared dream and understanding and culture, and that that's when it starts to grow beyond one person and the idea of someone who holds everything together tightly to we hold this together. And I think that that, that process and that practice, 
again, it's a craft. There are lots of tools and techniques, and I've seen a lot of the work of facilitation and holding space in rooms directly applicable to leadership, um, entrepreneurship in general. Dreams are pretty expensive to chase, and a big part of the entrepreneurship story is around gathering in resources to, to finance the, the thing. So investment and entrepreneur, I think, is a really, uh, an entrepreneurship is a really interesting dynamic. I also think that there's, like, we, I love the, the thoughts today about value and around uh, a venture producing more value than it consumes. And I think that it's really important to remember that, uh, especially in the sort of the impact space, money has real value. It costs about $25 New Zealand to, um, for 30 minute cataract surgery to restore someone's sight. So if an investor gives you $100,000, they're entrusting you with the equivalent of the vision of 4,000 people. And that money has real value which can cause real things. And I think that there's part of that dynamic which is, um, is sort of worth remembering. And I think that that relationship between investors and entrepreneurs is there's, when, that, when someone backs you and says, I, I believe you can do what you can say, I believe that your team will achieve what you think you can achieve, that's a really sacred relationship. There's so much trust in that, there's so much of a sense of, of people believing in you and backing you, and there's also a huge amount of pressure and stress and responsibility. And I think this is some of that unique pressure to entrepreneurship, is when you have uh, when you're holding other people's dreams and you've taken resources with this idea of, hey, I think that thing's going to work, it's a really, it's a, you're in the middle of two pyramids hitting together. And I think there's pressure in that space. But there's also, like, there's something really beautiful there. So the archetypal image of a venture, this whole, like, a lot of our understanding about entrepreneurship and business has emerged from that merchant traders sort of era where you get people together, you launch out the idea of uh, you know, a ship in harbour is safe, but that's not what ships were built for. And I think there's something around entrepreneurship, which feels a lot like, the, I've, I've done a bunch of sailing, and when I talk to sailors, there's that, that call of the ocean, that uh, if you're not out there and in it and don't know where you're gonna end up, life loses something. And there's that, that call of the unknown, the adventure, the risk and, and whatnot, which feels very similar to me about the call of, of adventure. It's that you, know, you can always play it safe and do something small, but dreaming of something big and having a shot of it, there's, a, there's an excitement in that. And I think that, uh, the, that analogy of sort of leaving the harbour and being underway, being under sail, feels like it captures some of the story for me. And I really want to... Uh, uh, that, that phrase about ventures um, producing more value than they consume, that was the simplest, most elegant way I've seen of explaining that. So, Love it, going to use it forever. And I think that the idea that a venture, it's something magical. Like it, it, it takes in a really simple base things, performs magic on them, and they are more valuable. And I think if you've ever seen a percussionist pick up like some tins and some pots and some sticks and make something amazing, there's the, it, you can do amazing things with small inputs when you apply skill and when you apply the right sort of circumstances. So I think that that idea of a venture being something special where you take in things and you make them more for people, whether it's houses or music or whatnot, that that's, there's, there's something in that which is, again, really delightful. And also there's the reality of ventures failing. And I think this is, like, you hear a lot about celebrating failure. And if that's, that sort of, part of me thinks that's just crazy. I, I think there's something about celebrating surviving and they're celebrating people and the process and realizing that a lot of people who take a run at big things, it's not gonna work out how they hoped, that the dreams just don't work. Sometimes storms come along, sometimes you didn't sail properly. Whatever it is, there's that real visceral um, possibility of you're gonna fail and things won't work out. And I think that adds in this really, this context and dynamic to entrepreneurship. And for me, ultimately, this sort of uh, uh, coalesces into this idea of, I guess, the, this is what I found Googling for the cycle of life. And it was this art piece about someone talking about the, you know, the coming and going, the rhythms of life. And when I think about that impulse about creating something and a venture, there is a, there's something in that which feels profoundly human to me. That same human humanity which uh, creates a piece of art 
or dreams for the future of your children or whatever it is. And I think that there's something in this whole story of entrepreneurship which is profoundly about life and evolution. Like you incrementally try something. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but as a whole, our, our systems move forward, our, our culture improves, our technology, everything gets better, it evolves, much like life evolves. And I think that that, that process of uh, iterations and, and evolution is a, is, a, is a process in itself, and you can see living systems apply it, but you can see a huge amount of it in our work as entrepreneurs. So I guess that's the, for me, that's when I tried to think about what does the essence of entrepreneurship mean to me, that sort of, that story is where I went. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, the learnings. Where, where's the edge of my learning um, in my practice of entrepreneurship? And, this, and yeah, this is uh, it for me. One of the big things I've seen, especially for entrepreneurs uh, caring about impact and sort of wider social change, I think that there's something around, I believe I'll have as much impact, if not more, by actively sharing the most valuable bits of my research and learning with other people. The idea of we're applying a scientific method to launching ventures, the data and the learnings that we get from that scientific method, it's just like scientific research, that if you don't publish it, it doesn't contribute to the whole body. And if you look at how the constant improvements in open source software has affected engineering, that I think that the actively resourcing and making it a priority to proactively share what we're learning as entrepreneurs. It's really like, when you're in it, it's, it's really hard to say, oh, time to blog, time to do more things. Uh, that feels like just one more ask in an already busy schedule. But I, personally, I'm starting to see the importance of that. And you hear little stories about, you talk with someone and they hear a little bit about what you do and they take it and they jam on it and they take it in directions you never would, that there's a value in that. And I think there's a deep value in, it's not about sharing our stories and telling the, the standard pitch again, but What's the edge of your learning? And I would love to take a little piece of everyone here's experience and knowledge and synthesize that. That would level me up so much. And I think when you think about the whole uh, wider ecosystems we are plugged into, if we consciously resource sharing our learnings with each other, whether it's talks or whether it's uh, blogging more or whatnot, I think it would have a measurable impact on our collective success. I also think there's something, there's, there's a deep uh, cultural, like humans understand um, uh, stuff through stories. We have a huge amount of our brains which is wired around social things, so the stories we relate to the most are about individuals. And when you look at the, you know, the hero story and whatnot, that sense about you are destined to do this, there is a prophecy, you are the one, you have a lightning bolt in your forehead or whatnot is a really common narrative in so much of our cultural stories about heroes and individuals, and it's a completely false one, that no one who's achieved anything was really selected by some preordained council. They just stood up and said, I'm gonna try and do something. And I think that that, uh, that, that cultural narrative, it's really important to be aware of. I also think that there's a, a, again, even when you take that away and you just celebrate people who start things, because of our, we understand data through individual stories, those stories will be about individuals. And I think this is where, um, and again, that sort of makes sense, that's how humans remember stuff. But I think that gives us a intuitive uh, assumption about how the world works, which is wrong. Because I don't I think that culturally, we overemphasize founders and individuals a whole bunch. And that the way stuff really happens is a whole bunch of people swarm on it. And I think that it's, uh, uh, one thing I'm starting to think about a lot more is how to de-emphasize individuals in this work. I love the idea of individualism. I think we should celebrate it and definitely not throw things out from there, but celebrate it in the context of lots of individuals working together and creating a space for everyone to have their individual story that uh, is a powerful story that uh, directly impacts their values and their, their contribution. So uh, for me, uh, I've done a lot of work. Like it took me about four years to move from the, the first dreamer of Inspiral and the solo person holding everything together to fully step back into, I am just one person amongst a collective of peers. And that, it, I didn't really have any role models for that. It was really, I'm sure people have done it before, but I didn't know their stories. I knew lots of stories of heroic hero founders and or individual founders and I could rattle them off the top of my head, like how many celebrity CEO startups can you name right now? 
and how much of their data and their stories do you know, how much of those stories impact the pressure you feel in your work? And absolutely to talk what Vaughan said about this works hard. So I think consciously thinking about that and realizing we have cultural and you know, like individual human biases towards individual stories and we need to focus on reinforcing collective stories a bit more. I also think, like, uh, where's Dave? Dave's comment about, uh, okay, the, uh, we've got ideas about how we'd like to see finance work or startups work, but the reality is the world works this way and good luck. And I think that for me, there's this idea that our economic system is really broken. The majority of mature companies in our plan on our planet do not create value, they steal it. They are subsidized by society they have artificial monopolies, and that our, biz our idea of business, which has been massively successful in innovation and creating things, is based on this idea of stealing from society. That's what successful businesses do. And I think we really need to, and if you, sort of, you saw that intersection of the pie charts, which was like, here's an investable venture right here, that, that minute window. If you try and scale that down to, here's an investable venture, which actually generates value, more value than it produces, rather than evolving into something which will steal value, much smaller window. So I think as entrepreneurs, when we look at launching businesses and creating businesses and designing businesses, having this idea of, are we paying the true costs of our inputs? Are we producing something of true value? Are we a real venture or are we just a pirate? Anyone know what this graph is? Maybe wish you invested in it early on? Um, that's a log scale on the other side. That's the human population over 10,000 years. And so there's a, this context of our, our collective evolution in the sort of 10,000 year window. This is what the human population is doing. It's just, it's still going up. And I think that when you look at our economic systems that have evolved, even the ones over the last 200 years, they've evolved in this context of that last bit of that curve where there's just massive growth. And they've also evolved in this context of, uh, what would you say, commercializing everything they could get their hands on. Because when you look at the, the fundamental model of our companies is that if you're flatlining revenues, you're losing. You won't be invested in. Like if you have a down round, like that's that idea of growth. And I think, uh, who was it who loved growth? There was a really great one, John. And I think that idea of growth, it's, it's, it's so embedded into entrepreneurship and startups. Like, if you launch a startup that doesn't grow, well, it's, it's going to be you forever. And I think that growth is really natural and healthy for small things. And it's really unhealthy and um, damaging for mature things. And if you think about how individuals and biological things grow, is that there's this maturation. And we don't have that with our ventures. Our entire economic system is built on things never dying until just at the very end when everyone runs away like rats fleeing a ship. And so I think that... That's an important context to have when we think about ventures and entrepreneurship because so much of the traditional story is you build something and you sell it. And you'll sell it eventually into a public traded entity who will always try and grow it until the very end when it'll be collapse and fall into something else. And it will eat as much of the world it can to support that growth. So one of the ideas that I've been playing with for a while, and this is gonna be quite a long experiment, I think, when you think about the life cycles of companies, is this idea of capped returns. That I think one of the reasons why companies have to always grow is because every time someone puts money into it, whether they're traded it or in a financing round or whatnot, they're looking for uh, it to keep growing on it. So that the last round of investors is always gonna push for growth because that's, you know, you wanna return on your investment. You've given someone 4,000 people's eyesight. It's, you know, it, you want that to come back so you can, you know, give people sight. And I think that uh, the, the, that alone, applied at scale, would solve a fundamental thing of capitalism and how business works. And it's also, if you think about how hard it would be to convince investors to put money into your business with an idea of as soon as you put money in, here's a cap on how much you're ever going to get out. We're going to put a ceiling on it right now. And that's the sort of dynamic I'm playing with in current businesses that I'm working in. So whenever founders put energy into it, they know the total cap of what they'll get out that investors know what they'll get out of it, and that you manage this cap like you would another part of your business. So you say, you know, as a business, we've, we will never pay out more than 50 million or whatever the number is, and that when that point happens, that's the business buying itself back, 
and now all of its surplus goes to its social mission. That's, you know, investors should get a good return for their money. Entrepreneurs should get a good return for their risk and skills and value. And I think that you can give people great returns in this context of eventually capping the total returns from a business. And so this idea is something which I'm definitely exploring and playing with and whatnot, but it's also quite a contentious one and one that goes against the direct grain of pretty much all the financial forces in our current system. So interesting idea though. <laughs> I think ultimately it's about designing companies which will age with dignity. Because if you look at the life cycle of a startup, it's years. You know, if you're in your 15th year as a startup, you're probably, you know, you might be doing it really right or you might be most likely doing it wrong. The life cycle of companies is decades, normally. Some of them get a few centuries in them, um, but they're the anomaly. And I think that uh, we do not design our companies to die. We design them to grow forever. And if we design our companies to eventually die with dignity, where they've paid out good returns for investors and entrepreneurs, and, and had a great run at things and contributed to the evolution before something else coming and taking their place. Really different system to what we've got now. Another experiment I've been doing is around um, self-set salaries. And so again, this is just a simple thing of go around all the staff in the company, what do you think you should be paid? Getting them to have a, a sort of public and facilitated process around talking about it, that with each other. And then ultimately having a um, a thing where they set their own salary and don't have to ask someone's permission if that's okay. So the, the one sort of safeguard in that is that there's a remuneration team and they basically say, um, hey, when you go through that, so this process, did you know this market data? You know, you might be up or you might be down. Did you know what everyone else is doing in their salaries? Giving people that information to make the decision, but ultimately that team does not approve the salaries, people set their own salaries. The safeguard to this is, again, in the context of a self-managed team, is the conflict resolution process. So if you're doing something crazy with a website and I don't like it, there is a process where I can say, hey, you know, I don't like what you're doing. And that if that doesn't work out, then it's mediated and it keeps going. We reuse that process for, hey, I think you're paying yourself too much. What do you think about dropping it? And it's not the managers or the founders who have that conversation, it's one of the peers in the company. And again, this is, uh, again, in the more fringe side of things, but a lot of my work is around exploring the possibilities of decentralized organizing. And I think that uh, uh, the idea of, I love that idea around hierarchies and around get them right and then move beyond them. I love that idea around, you know, the complexities of different work, that it is really different time, like managing different timescales is a different kind of thing. I also see there's a real danger in celebrating or talking about employees as future entrepreneurs who haven't got there yet, or talking about entrepreneurs as future investors who just haven't made enough money. Because I think there are also fundamental differences to different types of work, and that some people might never want to aspire towards philanthropy. And that uh, having useful ways to apply your gifts and skills while still making an impact is a unique thing. So uh, I feel like there's a big yes and on some of those things. And for me, this is like the extreme sports of where my learning's at at the moment. Playing with salaries and like setting your own and pulling away all the levers of controlling that, that's really hard. And it requires a deep cultural connection between the sort of staff. And, but I think there's a, there's a something, like I've tried lots of things to build engagement in teams and ownership and deep connection with businesses. This thing has probably had the fastest and deepest response of, whoa, you mean I don't have to ask permission for my salary? For new people, like a lot of people? the culture you need to have to hold that process well is a really valuable culture in its own right. So I'll end with a story from probably my favorite book of the last few years, which was Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Leloux. And there's like, I, most, all the stuff I do, I pretty much just copy from places. Like that salary stuff, that's just Morningstar, that's just Semco, lots of people have done that before. And this, that book has got probably the most densest amount of things I've wanted to copy in it. And it, it did prompt the, the salary one, reading it there as well. And the story is along the lines of, when you look at penguins walking on land, they're waddling, they're not that great at it, they sort of look awkward and clumsy, and that you sort of wonder how they don't get eaten and how they survive and so on. And then when you look at penguins in the ocean, completely different story. And I think that there's this idea of potential that we sort of, we get used to what's normal. Like we look at, uh, like when I, uh, I started Dev Academy recently, which is a programming boot camp. And when I was over in San Francisco, I saw students who'd been learning for nine weeks solid, building stuff that took me 
a good couple of years to build stuff of the same quality. That what I had as my intuitive understanding of how long it takes to learn something was blown apart based off this sort of facilitated process. When you look at uh, what the Romans, they used to have lead piping for their water. So all the villas, lead pipes. And so everyone got lead poisoning. And that what they considered to be the normal consequence of aging was lead poisoning. And I think when we think about what normal is, whether it's the financial system, whether it's how we organize teams, whether it's how we practice entrepreneurship, I suspect that there is a huge amount of that which is just artificial limitations on what's possible. And that by sort of pushing beyond and embracing different ways of working, we can achieve far more than we think we can. And that's sort of, that's my sense around the decentralized organization and network-based organization model that it feels like there's a possibility there for like a 10x in increase in efficiency and performance. And that when we look at trying to actually compete in a very competitive, commercially driven marketplace, when you're starting to try and weave in these ideas of creating true value and impact, we need every edge we can get. Cool, so that's me. Joshua, that was awesome. And I just, just a real quick comment because I think this has resonated with a lot of people here. And I just wanted to add that um, where I think that you're really masterful is asking the right questions. Um, and Joshua and I, I was the chair of an organisation. We had two and a half thousand young people, which was big in New Zealand. Joshua was a trustee. And we, we decided that it was time for this venture to die, that it was reached its maturity and was no longer needed. It was a big discussion. Um, it was a difficult conversation to have. And the reason that we got through it is by Josh asking the right questions of the two and a half thousand young people that this could affect. And together, we, we held, ha conceptually, we held hands and, and we, we lay the venture to rest. So you're a master at doing this and in practice as well. And thanks for that. It made my job a lot easier. Yeah. I, I, uh, we, we've talked about capped returns, but, but it just strikes me in, in hearing you frame it this way. Of, um, like right now we have these milestones of either exit or IPO, and uh, both of which often conjure a lot of uncomfortable feelings for entrepreneurs, but because they're the socially rewarded um, milestones and celebrated, and almost like if, if this kind of you know, capped return limit was the new badge of honor, because basically you got to the graduation into uh, you know, social impact for good. Absolutely, and that idea, like I, I first bumped into that in the impact investment community who were looking at doing deals in, in economies where there was no IPO or on businesses where there was no trade sale. And so uh, coffee growers in Africa and lots of different things like that was where I first bumped into that sort of capture return thing. It's like if you could give it a word, like a um, like graduation, or like, yeah, I took my company to harvest in eight years, you know, or something like some, some metaphor where you could say instead of like, and then I had my big exit, you know, I love that idea of a new meme for entrepreneurs. Uh, that was brilliant, Joshua. And uh, don't take this the wrong way, but the, the first half seemed kind of boring, and I realize now that's because the second half was so provocative, and you had to sort of prove to everybody that you're actually an entrepreneur uh, before you're about to say the things you're about to say. <laughs> um, I've, I've been a capitalist. I've made a living that way. It's been very good to me. And a few years ago, just as you said, I realized um, I was running into these kind of CSRs, corporate social responsibility departments in a number of companies, and I thought to myself eventually, um, if they actually made the recommendation they ought to be making, they would recommend that the company be disbanded. That's what they should be doing. And I just caught a new uh, positive vision for the future um, whereby um, organizations, big companies, companies of all sizes, um, use Lumio to together collaborate that they indeed should shut the company down and disband it. Mm -hmm. so. Kenny. Yeah, I just wanted to offer another model or you know, raise the, up the ante a little bit too. Um, we had a company at Bioneers last year 
who's a board member of um, Biners, who's chief foreign lines from the Iroquois Six Nations in the States. And they formed a joint venture with the Swedish government. They actually refused to take any capital from the US because they thought it was so corrupted um, for what that's worth. Um, and what they're going to do with a large, it's an urban vertical greenhouse that's extremely sophisticated. They're actually committing future profits to the seventh generation. Hmm. So there's a different level of, you know, it can be, you know, it's the Iroquois law of the seed that if you observe this natural law of, of death and regeneration, that life will be everlasting. And so it puts everything in a different time frame. It's very different from a quarterly report. Mm, nice. Cool. I like that. Uh, further reflections? Adam, sorry. Um, I think I heard you talk about this the first time maybe a year ago or so, and I, it, it stuck in my head. Uh, the, 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 I'm putting the pieces together now, but the, the capped returns thing. Um, could fit really well with that, that monopolistic mindset that companies have to have to grow. If you could put that together and have a showcase, have an example of that, that would be like the, the sort of star you know, going forward, I think, that could inspire a lot of people to try it again. So I think that um, you know, having, having one, one example that we can do, and I'm, really, I'm personally really interested in this, that would be really, really exciting to put together as a project. And take the mindset, take the take the mindset of a corporation, but then apply it to something like this, and just say, you know, this is what we're going to do day one. That's part of the mission, and and get uh, a round of angel investors that all think it's really cool, and just kick it off, you know, and try it. I think mm -hmm. that'd be really cool. And so I know that um, what are they called? Tonic, T O N double I C, a global network of impact investors. I know they've put together deals like that. It was one of their case studies, which mm -hmm. I heard about. Um, and I think that, but I do think that if, if this idea has merit, then the way it would get traction is someone going and doing something really big with it. Mm -hmm. Like build an Uber with that sort of model and everyone right. will notice it and pay attention. Yeah. And if you can't build an Uber with that sort of thing, then what's the, you know, you need to look at the reasons for it. Try again. Yeah. And <laughs> so, I, but I do think that that's a, yeah, cool bit of, go for it. Good luck. I hope someone does. I love it. Yeah. Ah, good question up here. Um, I don't have a question, I just have a reflection. Just want to really appreciate and acknowledge the spacious way that you communicate your vision, your ideas, and what you're up to. Um, to me, really reflects the, just kind of that natural, inherent intelligence of the land and the organic nature of self-organization. And I really appreciate that about you, and I think you're a real uh, model to a lot of the entrepreneurs here and around the world. So thank you for, for just being on the path, bro. Cheers. <laughs> So uh, finally, just before we um, wrap this up, because you're such a master of asking the right questions, I thought it'd be kind of fun if you had a question for us. You could direct it to anyone in particular, if you want to be really evil or just the general group. I, do, I, I don't want to be evil, but maybe before that, and to give me thinking time, maybe I can hear Dave's question. Cause I, yeah. Thanks. I just wanted to echo everyone's appreciation of your talk. It was really great, really well thought out and really well delivered. <clears throat> and um, the idea of cap returns as an investor I find is really interesting, but I'd also like to find a way of capping my losses. Exactly. Mm. <laughs> because the, uh, I mean, the issue with cap returns is that uh, one of the reasons that I like to take punts on really young companies with really crazy ideas, because I know I'm going to lose quite a few of them, but you know, maybe, maybe one or two of them are actually uh, going to be big. So you know, cap returns overall or whatever. But just for the record, I, m when I asked my question earlier on in the day, um, it wasn't, you know, oh, this is the way the rest of the world works, good luck. My real question was, and this is a question I'd like to throw out to the crowd, and hopefully you know, you'll, you know, you'll support this, is how do we work together as a society to build experiments where we can test out these hypotheses for different ways of doing things in a controlled environment in a way where we can limit the damage not only to ourselves, but also to the subjects of our experiments, mm -hmm. the companies that we were working with, their customers, and so on. And I think that's really the key to breaking the paradigm, is building a whole bunch of little experiments and, um, and trying to figure out a way to scale those into a way that's actually going to compete with the monopoly rents system uh, that does control so much of the world. 
Mm, absolutely. And um, yeah, sorry for paraphrasing around that. <laughs> I think um, I've heard a few people like this idea of building bridges, and I think that the Kiwi Connect team have done, you, you can see the remarkable job they've done of just connecting a whole bunch of people from different places and bringing them together. And that idea of bridge builders and really good ones. I had a friend who, was, who does a lot with um, uh, sort of like um, uh, Pākehā understanding of the treaty and running facilitation around that, and he had the experience of, you know, twenty-minute conversation with Bill English around his, the, his understanding of everything, and the reflection I heard there was that no one had ever uh, explained that, in, explained this system in a way to him which was uh, understandable or appropriate or worked for his uh, sort of way of communicating, and that it was always from a very antagonistic "here's this" and you're and directly forming opposition around it. And I think that particularly when it comes to trying to transform a, an economic system or whatnot, then you, there's no way you can do that with most of the world opposing you. You have to be able to figure out what's the way to get people on board, what's the story and the language and the process that includes people. And I think that art of inclusiveness and working together is what's required to get like deep healing in, in sort of our systems. Uh, really hard work. And I think the final part would be one of my favourite metaphors for this type of environment, and I guess collaboration in general, is basically like jazz improvisation. You have your instrument, everyone else has theirs, you, you listen, you find spaces, you leave spaces. There's that idea of knowing what's your bit, what's your part, when are you up, when's someone else up? And I think that in terms of the investment stuff, like I'm a bootstrapper. Um, I, I bootstrap social enterprises. I know nothing about raising investment rounds. Um, Everyone in here has got so much more knowledge around that and that the people who are going to take forward cap returns if it's a thing are going to be not me and other people. Got a hand up over here. Hey Josh, thanks for that. Uh, coming at it from a completely different angle and I've been listening to what everybody's been saying today, I've seen lots of really dumb deployments of capital in the world. Um, you know, I've seen, uh, for example, eight fibre optic backbone networks built around the UK going to exactly the same places when one would have been perfectly adequate. So there goes seven times money, which has been completely wasted. Matthew brought up the example of 25 new ATS systems being built. Uh, I, I wonder if the problem isn't sometimes a dumb deployment of capital, uh, and so therefore ideas which are great don't get off the ground because people aren't thinking about things in a holistic manner and whether or not your capped returns model might actually make people think a bit more hard about where they are putting their money and, and the reasons that they're putting it there. It's just uh, it's more an observation more than anything else, but I don't know whether anyone sort of had any thoughts about it or, uh, or come across any instances. The immediate uh, thing that comes up for me around that is how does stuff get put into the commons? Like the reason why eight companies built fiber optics things is was each one owned it and they made money off owning it. Whereas if the, the fiber optic was, that was a commonly held place, which lots of people could use and the people who built it were incentivized and paid and, and so on, you could imagine a different structure doing things there. And I think this idea about that once a company's reached the harvest or it's paid itself off, that the fruits of it sort of live in the commons and are sort of accessible to, to all, I think is a useful thing. But exploring that idea of what, what does common ownership look like and what's in its appropriate use? Because this idea of like public and private has got a, uh, I feel like we've just got a whole lot of cultural baggage around different things that have and haven't worked. And that exploring where, what the appropriate level is would be really interesting. Um, and I guess to finish with Rebecca's request about if I had a question, it would basically be along the lines of, if that analogy is of a big jazz brand of musicians, what's your instrument and when's your part? And that how do people know what, what it is that you do and what, how you play and, or know the spaces that you're looking for? And that signaling system so that, because when it's six people on stage, you can look and you can hear and you can feel it and it's, it's quite manageable. 100 people distributed all around the place, how do I know what, what your instrument is and what spaces you're looking for and vice versa? Cool. Thank you, Joshua.